Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us for tonight's Conversations in Genre event. My name is Kelly Jo Brick. I'm the vice chair of the WGA Genre Committee. Uh, our committee uh, celebrates all things genre, from action to horror and uh, comedy to sci-fi. So we're very happy you could join us tonight. Our committee meets uh, every other month, the first Tuesday of that month. Our next meeting is coming up October 5th. We'd love to have you come join us. That's where we plan events like these. Also, uh, it's where you can get to meet your fellow genre writers. A few uh, quick thank yous. First of all, to our panelists, thank you so much for coming out and joining us tonight uh, and sharing your experiences with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks also to the subcommittee who helped bring this event together and to Greg, our liaison for the WGA. He just works tireless, tireless I can't say the word. He works really hard uh, to help bring, uh, uh, put these uh, events on. So we really appreciate his work. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for tonight, uh, writer, director, producer. He is the founder and chair of the genre committee, Dwayne Johnson Cochran. Dwayne. Hello everybody. Good evening. And everyone, thank you for joining us tonight for another very special event. I'm very proud to have two amazing writer, director, producers to chop it up in our Conversations in Genre series. Charles Murray and Malcolm Spellman, give it up. Thank you, everybody. Give it up. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Malcolm. Okay. So, uh, again, I'm Dwayne Johnson Cochran, um, founder and chair of this uh, organization. And first up, Malcolm Spellman, his credits include Empire. Truth Be Told, the doc series Hip Hop Undercover, Undercovered, and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier series. His films include Our Family Wedding, among others, and he has many film and TV projects in the ready set position. Next up, we have Charles Murray. His credits include, as a writer and producer, Sons of Anarchy, Luke Cage, Empire, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and his feature film Things Never Said, which also was his directorial debut along with many other projects also in the ready set position. So thank you two men for being here tonight. Well, thank you for having us. Okay, so first question, I wanna, I wanna start this conversation where you guys can add what you need, talk to each other. We, I'll just sort of lead it around, but mostly I wanna just sort of start at the beginning of how you guys became who you are and uh, also the fact that you guys are 30 year friends for 30 something years. Um, and so we're gonna get into that. But first and foremost, when you think about genre and writing and writers who have the ability to not only write and thrive, but can shape shift into other genres really well. Um, tell us about your career. Tell us about how the beginning right here, Malcolm, how did you start? Where did you form your first worldview as a writer? Ooh, um, starting, I think for me, I guess my worldview uh, uh, as a writer just started off started off with like my worldview as a human being, which is you know I definitely identify as being you know a regular person, a working class person, and that roughly I mean I'm not super educated um um and i don't covet that um I, I i take pride in being sort of as long much as i can be tapped in with just regular day-to-day -day humanity um and you know i broke in with a spec script uh just about 20 years ago um um and it, it was probably the best most hollywood moment of my career has really never been duplicated which was you know i was living in this hovel over on cochran and wilshire uh, me and my current wife uh and were at that time broken up as boyfriend and girlfriend and i submitted i did a blind submission to a icm back then 20 years ago i think the agent i submitted to might have been the only prominent black agent in Hollywood, her name was John Williams. Um, John Williams. Yep, yep. 
And I got a phone call Monday morning at 9 a.m. Like with just a voicemail saying back then, you know, we didn't, I didn't have a cell phone um, um, saying, hey, this is John Williams. I'm an agent with card. I want to get some of your movies made. That was, it was off and running for better or for worse after that. And this, the worldview you created before you wrote that script as a working class brother from where? Where are you from? Where, what city are you from? I'm, I'm, I'm from Berkeley, California in the Bay Area. Um, I grew up in, you know, everyone sort of romanticizes where they grew up. I really, really loved the neighborhood I grew up in. It was a black neighborhood. No one really had money, but it wasn't a war zone. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it was, I think, a snapshot at what our, it was like the last of a dying breed to kind of like, there was enough hood in it that you could get into a little bit of trouble, but it was relatively safe as far as, you know, uh, compare, you know, we grew up, me and Charles grew up during the bad old days when it was literally war and murder in the streets of every major city in America and being black. And the minor America, ones. <laughs> <laughs> and the minor, well, yeah, you're right. Like the worst, so you come from one of the roughest cities in the country. Yeah. But it was extra intense back then. And so it, it it's very hard to convey to people what it felt like to grow up in the 80s and the early 90s, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, um, sure. Yeah, so yeah, I'm from Berkeley though. So Charles, I know I'm from the Midwest, you're from the Midwest. This minor city you're talking about is? Gary, Indiana. You see how he did that, Malcolm? You see how he didn't have to go big about Chicago? And then talk, uh, you know, this is this, this is a this is an adult. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dwayne. Well, you know, um, forget Chicago. Gary is Gary, and Gary is a place where people come from, and people have a worldview from Gary. And you came from that that, that locale, and yeah, what were the indelible images that? You remember that form your creative vision early on. Yeah, it's funny. I was I was telling um, I was telling I was telling somebody this the other day. Um, uh, the the first movies I remember seeing in the theater, my sister and my brother took me to see The Exorcist the weekend it came out. So I was nine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Me too. Uh, a bunch of kung fu movies that used to play on channel 32. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, Batman with Adam West. And uh, and then my, and then again, my brother took me to see Death Race 2000, and my sister took me to see Fritz the Cat. This was all by 11 years old. <laughs> Fritz the Cat. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Yeah. While all of that was going on, you know, I was I was a latchkey kid, so I was constantly in front of the TV, um, you know, watching everything from uh, uh, one of the greatest shows ever made, The Flintstones, sure. to watching the Three Thirty movie, which was everything from Cooley High to Lawrence of Arabia. So I was ingesting it all. And then you had Family Classics on Sunday, which you know, and then. Sure. You had when movies were movies and you saw all the, all the gangster movies at, at 1030 on Sunday. But before you did that, you watched Monty Python and Benny Hill. So. <laughs> your, your film school and your <laughs> sensibility is being basically nourished by TV. Yeah. Which is, you know, yeah. Which is which, which kind of funny. As a grown up, you know, when you get into the business and they tell you to write one thing, if you're a child of television and syndicated TV, you'd never agree with that because you watch so many different things. Right. That means both of you guys, when it comes to genre, I was saying this earlier before you got on, Charles, you're, when I can tell in your credits, you're pretty genre agnostic. You can write things based on things that you have experienced because you don't have just one vision. Your vision is wide. Right. Your perspective is wide. Yeah. Um, 
did you ever feel, Malcolm, Charles, question both of you guys, you ever feel that even though Juan Williams called you up, Malcolm, and says, I want to get your films made, she pegged you as this kind of writer? Or Charles, they said, you're this kind of writer? Or do you say, listen, I, I do everything? It, it's, I, for me, I feel like if one mistake I made in my career was wanting to start off doing everything because I didn't understand the relationship between writer, exec, I mean, sorry, writer, rep, town, right? And so what you want to do is one thing. You want to write everything. Is writing everything the best way to get to write everything? No. I think if I had to go back and talk to my younger self, I would have said, stay in one lane longer and then branch out and build from there just because, you know, uh, uh, my manager once, re not that long ago said, basically when you're writing, there's, let's say there's three writers up for one job. It's a horror movie, right? And here's the three writers. We have Shelly Winters, right? She's this young, you know, girl from wherever who, has been writing these really fucking crazy and esoteric horror movies. She wrote one you've never heard of, and she's got a, a, ver a complete reinvention of a horror genre that'll probably never get made, but she's deeply passionate about horror, right? And then you say, we have uh, Fred Livingston, right? He's an older, more established writer. He's written all the paint by numbers horror movies you've ever seen not particularly inspired but has done it a million times right and then we have Malcolm Spellman he writes everything mm -hmm. who are they gonna hire one of those other two you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying and mm -hmm. so but wait uh, wait 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 this motherfucker's gonna argue with me and well, that's good I was gonna ask he's Charles bully? A different he's no. bully and he picks on me no, I, I'm not picking on you, but I, I, I see what you're saying, but I always saw it differently for us because we were of color. Mm -hmm. And even if you had been that horror writer at that time, you still may have come in third when we were coming into the business. So I believe that what you did worked for people like us because we couldn't get in line and still be next if we had stuck to doing one thing. That's all I got to say about that. So you're well, saying- Had I been white, my same advice applies then. <laughs> so all, all, all things being equal is what you're saying. Yeah, I'm saying all things being equal, we had to keep we had to keep diversifying until we could find a place that we could actually get in a proper line. That's real. Malcolm, what do you see in Charles's work that influences you or impresses you? And the same question to you, Charles, regarding Malcolm's work. It, it is for me. Charles is one of the most complete filmmakers that I know, period, of any age, gender, race. And um, I don't think there's any dimension of what we do that he doesn't do well. Um, obviously, obviously, if I have to pick, like if I was describing Charles to the town or whatever, right? Ironically, I would probably say he's a great drama writer. You know what I'm saying? He's directed, he's done Luke Cage, he's done all kinds of shit like that. But like this script I know Charles from most is a project called Phenom about this. Yeah. I just watched his movie, which is great, about this basket. Basically, I don't want to say it because someone's going to steal the idea because I got such a clean pitch for it. But it was set in the world of basketball. It's just, you know, a father son story. It was, it, it was dope. So, you know, I think, you know, in our community of, and you know this Dwayne, in our community of black men writing TV, 
you know, Charles is 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 a foundational uh, uh, resource. We all, you know, he hates this. We all come to him for advice. Um, <laughs> Um, um, he hates it. Know, he hates it. He does. <laughs> but so I would say this: the main thing that's dope about Charles is very, very rare for anybody, which is you can talk to this motherfucker about editing, about running a room, about running a show, about writing a movie, about directing. He's literally done all of that shit, right? And then if you want to just talk about him being a writer, I wouldn't even the bigger, fancier credits aren't even the ones that I identify him with. I really think about him as a guy who does sort of personal genres, I mean, dramas about people. Charles, the same thing about Malcolm. Uh, I, Without getting into my looks, Charles. Well, you sexy. Oh, the conversation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I believe uh, having watched Malk uh, from jump, like the, watching his entry, because I was around when he was, that script that he's talking about, I was around. And knowing how much of a mountain uh, we've all had to climb, um, his, his ability to, like his writing is like off the charts good. He's, he's amazing in that regard, but he's also, his awareness for when things take a shift, people or the business, and being able to uh, have the foresight to go, here's where, here's some, something's coming up and we need to change, is remarkable. Um, his ability to uh, uh, his ability to walk into a room, high or low, familiar or otherwise, and be able to um, almost become the center of attention, you know. And I, and I say almost only because you know you heard his 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 humble brag about how he likes to keep himself low to the ground and 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 be of the people he right. is capable of being of the people and then being of the of the classes so to speak with ease and and i think that the uh amalgamation of the two things is something that a lot of folks is, is where a lot of people stumble mm -hmm. you know and yeah. and and then on top of that he he is more than willing to kick game to people who can't see those things. You know, I think that's the one thing that I think as we've both grown in our careers, that's the one thing, the one bond outside of our friendship that is very solidified is that he and I are both of the mind that uh, uh, own knowledge has to become shared knowledge. Yeah. So, and I so I totally, totally respect him for that. Let's um, talk a little bit about some individual projects here. Uh, things I know about and things everyone else probably wants to talk about. But first I want to talk about Phenom for a second. I read Phenom a long time ago. And um, how did that story originate? We don't want, you can just sort of give you a one liner on it, but how did it originate and will it ever be made? <laughs> According to IMDB, it's always it's always in development. <laughs> it's about two days away from being shot. But you know, IMDB also has me working on Queen Latifah's talk show, and that oh. didn't happen. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, it's uh, I came late to basketball. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was my it was my friend Earl Cole uh, when I moved here, and and literally the only two people I knew were Malk and Michelle, maybe a couple other people, um, um, Chan, Barry, and and another friend of mine, and I was like, you know, Malk and Michelle are going to get tired of me coming over to their house every other day, and so I was talking to Earl, and I was like, yo. 
how does how do people meet out here? And he was like, well, you got a hoop. And I was like, ah, yep, I don't do that. And of course, I'm six foot four and I got a seven foot wingspan. So people don't believe that until I went out and looked like um, chief. A, right, um, a filmmaker. <laughs> no, I, I, play basketball. <laughs> I, went, I went out there and looked like Chief from uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Hold it up! <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, but, but I have, you, my, um, I, I, I just, when I do deep dives on things, I go in. Mm -hmm. And I started teaching myself hoop and I started like buying every book on like the history of hoop and all this other kind of stuff. And uh, I was watching ESPN Sunday Conversation and they were talking to Kobe Bryant and they were asking him about how he models himself after Jordan. And he was like, yeah, you know, Magic's my favorite player, lie. Um, uh, and, you know, people say that I look like him because I'm 6'6 six, six, and we, we both play the same position. But ESPN kind of set him up. And they had a split screen going while he was saying all of this stuff, negating his love for Jordan. And they were showing the armband being on the same arm, the leg, the, the, the compression uh, sleeve on the same leg. The, you know, Kobe used to walk like pigeon toed like, like Jordan, yeah. the way he chewed gum when he first started, before just he got his own identity. Just mimicking Michael, mimicking Michael. Mimicking Michael. And I turned to my wife and I said, man, what if at some point we found out that Kobe was Mike's illegitimate kid? Mm. And that's it, the concept and she, of the film. Yeah. And she went, well, that would be a good story. And it, it sprung from that. And, and then, um, I wrote it and it sat for seven years. And then it got me a job writing a basketball movie at Lionsgate. And the week I turned in the Lionsgate script, Screen Gems called because of State Street mm -hmm. and bought the script. And, right. um, and they had it set up like the, it, it was, three months out of pre-production and Chris Brown was going to play the kid. Oh, and shit. He, he had his, he had his, he had his moment with Rihanna and it went away. Uh, <laughs> Same thing and, happened to me. <laughs> and so it's, you know, uh, every now and then it'll pop back up in conversation. Yeah. But I think uh, when they took away uh, the ability, and I, I think it just came back though, when they took away the ability for a team to, to jump, to skip college and jump in. They just took it back. They just put it back? Yeah, well, you can't jump. I think you have to have one year of college. I'm not sure, but you, you just can't jump into the NBA, I think. Right, like, well, that, yeah, that was the big twist, so. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know. I don't, I don't, I have no idea. The funny thing is, if I can keep going for a second, was I was going to write, there were two versions of it. Malk, you don't know this. Um, one of the versions was because of my love for Michael Mann's first TV movie, The Jericho mm. Mod. Oh, yeah. And I had read an article about uh, uh, a kid who went to prison whose dad was the top basketball player in that same prison. So I was gonna write that version mm. or I was gonna write the NBA version and my, and my wife was like, no, nah, write the NBA version. So that's how it ended up happening. And Malcolm, um, tell, tell, both of you guys work for Empire. Mm -mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. He was he was gonna let that slide, but you didn't did it again. Okay, well, uh, we'll talk to you, Malcolm, about your, <laughs> <laughs> your tenure on that on that uh, on that illustrious show. Uh, Want to add anything about Empire before we go into anything else? Um, Empire to me 
was, uh, uh, I mean, that was one of, shit just works out sometimes. Like I've been punished so many times in this business, not literally punished, but shit has mostly not worked out for me. And most of my 20 year career, I have been unemployed, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes though shit does work out and Empire is one of the situations where I was embraced by not only the higher ups, but the people at the network and the show was a phenomenon and they and Eileen, the showrunner took special care of me. So I got to in three years go from having never worked in TV to co-EP. I got I got to do post, be on set, you know, run a writer's room, you know what I'm saying? Like I got to learn everything. And then the whole group of people there was special. It was just shit. I mean, it's really crazy that that all came together the way it did. And that gives me another question to ask both of you. And you can tell me when you who wants to answer first, but Charles. how do each of you deal with uh, the palace intrigue of studio network streaming and executives? You know, along with the film executives, how do you deal with trusting a creative point of view from one executive or group of, and then things shift and you have to deal with, how do you, how do you deal with this? What has been your method that you can extend to some other fellow writers in keeping your vision intact? I, well, you know what? That's kind of a twofold question because it is for, for us, it's always shifted. There's never been solid ground for us. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as black folk, as guys getting into the business older than mm -hmm. most people, we've always had to just expect turbulence, you know? And, and I feel like uh, the thing that helps you navigate that the most is what me and Malk and Nichelle and a few other people have is, is our friendships and, and our ability to, you, you know, it's hard to be open when you're going through this. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a little bit more, it makes it a little bit more uh, lethal if you don't look at it like a therapist tells you to look at their, your life. You have to find people that you can trust and talk to and get perspective on things from, because uh, listen, there have been days when this dude has called me and said, hey, tell me what you think of this and we'll talk for hours. And, and two days later, I'm calling him going, this, this is some bullshit and, 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 <laughs> and I'm about to snatch somebody up by their fucking neck. And then Malcolm goes, hold on. And we either meet to eat or we stay on the phone or whatever. And it, it's all, it's just going back and forth. And so you can't expect, you can't expect something like this that's not built on solid foundation to suddenly find firm, uh, uh, you know, to suddenly be firm and, and set. But it's the people that you surround yourself with while you're going through this that help you navigate those things that you're saying. Do you feel, Charles, and I asked this question to you also, Malcolm, do you feel that you are first a filmmaker who writes in TV or a television writer who makes movies? Uh, I feel like, so I was talking to Rob Oatman the other day. And Rob uh, directed the X-Files movie, the first one. Mm -hmm. He comes from television. He was, he was directing TV when he was 19 mm -hmm. and, and did Star Trek Next Generation, X-Files, and he's done like tons of pilots. And we were talking about his son watching, uh, watching movies on his phone. <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, but every movie that you think is a classic, you and I think is a classic, we saw on television. Right. 
And, and now movies have become television where everything's in a goddamn close up. So why shouldn't he be able to watch it on his phone? So I, I just feel like I'm a storyteller. And if you put me in the right environment, if you say, hey, this is a, if I say I'm a, a writer, am I not a writer if I write novels and then I move to haikus? <laughs> and if I move to haikus and move to poems, if I move to poems and move to magazine articles, I'm still a writer. You're just changing the form around. Right. And I may have to get more expertise if I step out of where I'm comfortable. So I don't look at the end game, which is, does it come out on television? Does it come out in the movie theaters? I just look at it as, am I telling the story that I want to tell? Malcolm? Um, I was going to lie and say, I don't see genres and say, so, you know, or mediums, I don't care, creating, say some fake art, artistic shit. But then I just, then I realized how unpleasant the feature experience can be for a writer, at least for me, you know what I'm right. saying? And that is part of what drove me to TV is I felt like I, I, I wasn't gonna be able to engage as thoroughly as I wanted to creatively as a feature writer. Whereas in TV, you get to be a part of all the conversations and that's usually a good thing. So I, though I still do both and I, lo I love the right circumstances for writing features, you know what I'm saying? I need another voice, like in features for me, the standard is it's not about my voice. I need another voice to help bull through whether it's a big time not a big time whether it's a director or a producer with some juice for a feature to feel satisfying it's terrible to me when i get in these situations where you write in a movie and there's five different people giving you notes on one call and you can't you you can't snatch everybody up creatively and say this is one my opinion, whatever, right? I don't like that. Um, so definitely long-winded way to say um, I now err towards TV. Mm -hmm. um, um, I still write movies. I'm writing one right now, but I now more often than not think about my creativity in the form of TV. And to that point, um, we'll, we'll talk about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier this big deal that you are involved in, that you've done this great series on, that you are now writing a film on the same subject. Um, tell me, tell us all how that came about. Um, and then I'll ask you both about Marvel in general and, and, and specifically, but talk, just talk about how this came about, how you got this job and, and the phenomenal success that's come from it. Um. This was the job came. I'd I'd gotten to a place it was about three years ago, I think, right? At that point in my career, I was already on I kind of don't maybe I don't period do casting calls. So, you know, I won't I think I could say fairly honestly, I don't go after anything that's not a person who wants to work with me. It just don't make no sense. If they can't commit to saying we'd love to work together, I, I'm cool. And that was a casting call. So that was um, everybody went out there just to define it. Everyone, they put a big, big old net out there and said, everybody, bring us a pit. To be fair to them, I don't know how many people they invited in, but I know it was competitive. And Clearly. you know, I, I worked hard um, um, and got the gig. I guess that's the boring part. And then you get to go through the Marvel, Mar sorry, I ate some gummies earlier. Um, you get to go through the Marvel process. Um, and- Pass them on. That, that shit is a whole new learning curve. I mean, it's great once you embrace it, but it's a whole new learning curve when you walk through the door. Um, to, and we burn up too much time to talk about it you know, on this Zoom, because it's it's intricacies. So that's all like, I worked hard. 
I, 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 so I worked hard for it. I think what set my pitch apart was how committed I was, how I, the, the core things I wanted to explore, I was, they knew I was absolutely committed to them and nothing else. And I think they like that kind of conviction. So mm -hmm. Charles. What I, I couldn't get hired, so I got nothing to say about it. You, Charles, were, they talk about you worked on uh, Luke Cage, that was the big Marvel show. <laughs> yeah, and also Charles, you with the same guidelines that I think Marco went through with Marvel and all the things that they have in terms of their development process, you did the same thing with Star Wars and the Clone Wars. There is, I'm sure, a book, a style book, things they need. Tell us about that. I mean, that's a whole nother genre. Not genre, but subgenre. Well, um, you know, the the reason, and because I'm not a, you, I'm not a Star Wars junkie. Like I'm a comic book junkie. I got probably 15,000. Right. 15,000 comic books. Yeah. Now. And this is this is like my third collection. I lost my first one. Um, I had to transition my second one to help out uh, 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 a comrade. And but I always just like keep collecting Star Wars. I'm, I wasn't a big, huge um, diehard Star Wars fan. Um, I chose Clone Wars because um uh, uh actually because Ahsoka looked like my daughters. Mm. And and my oldest was having um emotional turbulence about her race. And and a lot of it had to do with the business that we're in. Mm. You know, this is this is the place where you make the sausages and you know what goes in the sausages and you kind of tell your kids, don't eat the sausages, you know? So um, she ate a couple while I wasn't looking. <laughs> and so when- She threw up. <laughs> exactly. And so when, when I um, shifted her paradigm in terms of what she should watch on television, it led to the first Clone Wars movie. And then uh, a couple of years later, I was asked if I was interested in working on it. Um, and I said, yeah. And when I went and told the guys who were in charge of hiring why I was there, because it's, it, would, it would continue the legacy of me telling my daughter that you get behind things that you believe in, they hired me. And, and, and instead of having a book we had George, <laughs> you know, so every year for 10 days, he and Dave Filoni would sit with us and we would craft the seasons that we, that they were going to shoot the following year. Mm. So basically he was the walking style book. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. With Luke Cage, Marvel, with Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Marvel. Both Two different Marvels. Two different Marvels, and I want yeah. to talk to you about that. Two different Marvels. Yes. You have Marvel for Legacy Marvel. Yeah. You know, we have you we have Marvel Television, and Malcolm worked under Marvel Studios. Mm -hmm. And so that was a very defined line. Explain so, that to, to everybody here. Well, um, w when Marvel got sold to Disney, and I... There was no Marvel television. Right. And and Kevin was in charge of Marvel Studios and then the all the feature projects. And that's Kevin Fiji, right? Kevin Feige. Feige, yeah. Feige. And then uh, while once it landed at Disney, Iger was like, hey, we got to make money across all platforms. <laughs> and so he uh, wanted to implement a television division. And I, I, it happened with Feige's eye on features. Right. And so Jeff Loeb was brought in and there was a, a consortium of guys who were brought in to develop television. And Jeff went to uh, Netflix, I, I believe this is the story. He went to Netflix and said, 
we'll do five shows. And then at the end of the five shows, we'll do one uh, uh, group show. And Netflix said, where do we sign? And so um, when, uh, after they hired, a friend of mine uh, was the VP and he hired Cheo uh, to run uh, Cage and, and Cheo reached out and asked me to come and be his number two. I see. And that experience on that show, the Netflix show, tell us about that. How that, how that, Chael is your, for, your friend, but tell us about it. Was, it was an interesting experience, but it was an interesting experience because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been pretty adamant and, and, and probably turned a lot of people off when I, I, I tell folks, um, you know, when white folk decide what a black show is, it's it's a hard, it's it's a fine line between it not being a black show, because we have to we have to I don't know what what word or what phrase you want to use we have to shape it to a degree where it's understood by them. So when we go, hey, this should be in the show, this should be in this should be in the show. If they don't get it, they're ready to push back. It's a it's a black show in a Marvel universe. It it's a but here's the thing, Marvel the Marvel universe should be everything, right? That's true. But when you don't have everyone in these pilot seats, then it becomes a black show in the Marvel universe. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So what we tried to do, what we did, I think we, we succeeded in many ways was uh, to show that this universe, this Harlem, this man who, you know what, what I love about Luke Cage is that nobody stops to realize that it's the Captain America story. That's right, the same story. Right, except it happened for him in prison instead of happening, you know, he goes in a tank, he, a solution right. makes right. him, yeah. exact, you know, and if, and I think if you look at the, um, if you look at the ranking of superpowers, Luke and Cap are like kinda just below Thor and Hulk, mm -hmm. right? So it, when, when Cheo went and pitched, he pitched, uh, guys, this is, this is, these are people. These are regular fucking people. And this is a regular guy who ends up in a situation just like Captain America. And they were like on board with it, you know, because I thought my concern was that they were going to try to do the 70s version. Ah. And, you know, like I told, every exec that sat in front of me one day at, at Marvel, I didn't grow up in, hearing a man call another man sugar, <laughs> you know, as yeah. they were fighting, you right. know what I'm saying? Right. And, and to know that uh, the, the white guy who wrote it was basically, it was his way of some say paying homage to black exploitation, Ah, 70s, black exploitation, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And some say that kind of kind of mocking it. Right. And I was like, don't mock us. Right. You know, and Cheo was definitely on the don't mock us tip. And I think that what set it apart was they everybody else didn't know what to expect. They didn't know that they were going to get the Cotton Club modernized. They didn't know that they were gonna get this brother who had uh, superpowers who was conflicted about him. Right. They didn't know it was gonna be at the cost of love for him and all, you know. And so they kind of got out of, the, they kind of got on board. They got more than they bargained for though. Yeah, they got more than they bargained for, but they only got more than they bargained for when they kept thinking that Wait, but isn't this how a black person should be? <laughs> and you know, and, and we kind of like, we kind of kept pushing back and kept pushing back and saying, no, you don't know it. 
you don't right. know it, try to understand it. If you can't understand it, know that we've been there doing it longer and you got to trust us on certain things. Question for you, now, Malcolm. Charles has 15,000 comic books right now, maybe more, maybe less, had many more before. Did you have a comic book background when you were coming up as a writer, coming up as a thinker, coming up as a person creating your worldview, was comic books part of your life? And if you, you know, just, I want to know, was comic books part of your reading, your fantasy world? Yeah, um, I was very, very big on comic books coming up. Um, and I'm, you know, Berkeley was a comic book town. We had two legendary stores there, Comics and Comics and best of two worlds. And that was before every city had a comic book shop. You know what I'm saying? And they they was already legendary. Uh, me and my boys, Charles knows some of them, Jab and AD and all these dudes would go up to comics and comics and create diversions and steal comics. You know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, we'd gotten it down. I mean, we was nuts about it. So yeah, I always collected um i understood the thinking i understood the, I, I i was old enough i was young enough to be passionate and i was old enough to be able to see and understand as the marvel universe was figuring itself out and really coming up with that con you know that true true mastery of the shared universe um i was able to grasp that um, um so yeah definitely was a comic book kid coming up so when you start, when you went in for the, the job, you got the, uh, the, the Falcon and the uh, Winter Soldier. And as Charles talks about Luke and the world and Harlem and this character, how did you see the Falcon? How did you see the Winter Soldier? This is, this is a buddy movie. And as you said in one of your interviews, it's the antithesis of WandaVision. It's like, it's it's a buddy story, but it's two guys who can love each other, but also can fight each other, and they're dealing with each other as buddies who also can have conflict. Did you find that to be the way in, or were you thinking about it in racial terms, or both? I I was I thought a lot about Sam. I mean, it, the race thing was so obvious, even before I stepped up, they knew they was gonna have to deal with it because a black dude taking on those stars and stripes is just a whole thing. And when I showed up, that was what my whole pitch was about and the pathos involved with that and the psychology and what it would take for him to get there. You know what I'm saying? Like I knew, they knew that was gonna govern whatever uh, uh, I did. The buddy cop angle and the energy that comes from that, that's one of Marvel's secret weapons. I have I cannot fucking understand why other of big brands don't do it. But they oh they try to always give their movies a distinct personality that gives them a common ground to talk to their creatives as execs. So uh Winter Soldier, the movie, is a spy thriller. Uh, the last Avengers movie is a heist film to the point that they say, so you're talking about a time heist, right? right. Mine was a two-hander. The uh, last one, like each of their movies um, um, have that simple of a disposition and it allows them to always be able to dig into the shit that the fans love and that comes with the universe and that's with every Marvel movie. At the same time, it always gives them a fresh uh, uh, entry entry point. Um, I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> it was mostly about uh, how you came through it, how you came through creating this oh, character. Yeah. So for me, yeah. if for me, the idea of exploring, like I definitely was pretty thorough on Bucky also, but first and foremost, getting into what the Stars and Stripes meant to Sam as a black man, especially in this current climate, you know what I'm saying? And seeing how to play that shit off of what was going on. That was the governing thing. Like my, whatever changed in my take a million times and my pitch and the writing that remained dominant all the way through. 
Charles, Kevin is making the push, reimagining the characters in Marvel with the big push of color, diversity, risk taking. Do you feel the audience will go with Marvel or do you get an inkling that legacy Marvel fandom with things getting more representative of the population, maybe like, you know what, you know, not for us. Um, I mean, what are you feeling? <clears throat> well, I don't give a damn. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if, if you're not willing to take a risk, step out the box, mm -hmm. right? And, and I don't think that there's been anything that's bare, that's bore fruit that hasn't been about taking a risk. Right. You know, uh, one of my favorite movies is Singing in the Rain. <laughs> and Singing in the Rain is literally about everybody in the silent era losing their fucking minds because somebody invented talkies. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so when you think about, and, and, and first of all, I don't see where the risk is by showing a film world that looks like a real world. Where's the risk in that? Exactly, representing the population. That's, that's, that's actually settling in and doing what the fuck you're supposed to do, I believe. Um, but if you wanna call it a risk, if you wanna say, if you wanna say that studios should be concerned about their money, yeah, let's talk about money for a second. Yeah. Right? Because that's where, that's where the word, that's where that phrase keeps lending itself to. Um, so uh, Warner Media is now HBO, HBO Max, TNT, uh, 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 Turner, uh, discovery uh, and let's say every movie that Warner makes every year um, they spend about five billion dollars that conglomerate eats five billion bucks in a fucking week and a half right where's their risk right Zero. they're going to own the shit into perpetuity right so Suicide Squad and Suicide Squad the reboot and Birds of Prey cost $700 million. By the time they repurpose it and sell it to all the different cable channels and sell it back to themselves and wait and do special editions in 10 years and resell it to different TV stations that need content, that's why they take that risk. They don't spend those dollars before- They have their money back. They do that evaluation. Right. So if you're telling me, oh, we can't add, we can't do Shang-Chi because it won't make money. I go, well, you got, you release five, this, this town releases 500 movies a year. And we all know that 450 of them don't make their money back, <laughs> but you keep doing it. Right. So if you use that as the excuse for not taking said risk, you're also keeping yourself from reaching the dollar that might lie somewhere else. So anytime somebody tells me, hey, we can't do this because these group of, this group of people won't do, they won't spend the dollar, yeah, yeah, they will. It might take longer for that dollar to, to come back. You know, uh, if you watch the, the movies that made us, um, they've got a, a making of on The Nightmare Before Christmas. Right. The Nightmare, Nightmare, Nightmare Before Christmas cost 24 to make and it made 46 at the box office. And then DVDs came in. Right. And then merchandising came in. All that ancillary market. All that ancillary money has made The Nightmare Before Christmas one of the most profitable movies for Disney. So where they keep trying to sucker us is the front page to the fifth page of Variety and Hollywood Reporter and three scrolls on deadline. Oh, poor us, we're not making movies, so we can't make movies to reflect y'all. And yet 
when you look back and say, well, the Joy Luck Club made money. I don't know why it took so long to make Crazy Rich Asians, which made money, except for the powers that be don't look like any of those people. Right. And that's that's what it comes down to. Yeah. So when risk taking is 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 a code for I just don't want to get out of my bed and go into and jump in a cold pool first thing in the morning. I got two things I want to bring up here. This is about uh, the phenomenal sort of um, progress both of you have uh, made. Uh, Malcolm, you have 51st, your company has an overall 51. deal. 51. 51. 51. 51, overall deal at HBO right now with your spouse. Very proud of that. I want to talk about that. And Charles, the Red Book deal. I want to talk Red about box. Red Box, sorry. Red Box deal. I want to talk about that. These are two uh, really amazing developments in both your careers. Uh, Malcolm, let's talk about 51. The uh, uh, It's a, we've been working as a company for three years and two years ago, or not quite two years ago, but almost two years ago, we did the deal with HBO, which allowed us to bring on people to help help us work and run the company and manage the projects. And your wife again is uh, Nichelle Tremble. Nichelle uh, Tremble. Um, 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 and you know, it's, it's, it's been a journey. Um, um, wait, what was the, what was the other half of the question? I'm sorry. These, <laughs> tell us about the 51. Oh, about the 51, yeah. how it came about and what you're doing there at HBO and the kind of projects you're trying to make over there. And we, I would say this, the, you know, the line we use, our go-to line is uh, point of view with a uh, popcorn appeal, meaning though we focus on diversity, we really focus on culture because that's what comes with that. That's what makes classic stories fresh. And we want to do shit that's big and universal. I think there has been an amazing push in the world of diversity to do really specific stuff that is designed to resonate with our people or with people who the filmmakers are, uh, are uh, you know, founded their culture. But I think one of the problems is if it becomes too niche, these networks get very, very comfortable doing smaller budgets with less expectation on what it can do. And I think we've had these sort of pushes before where people was like, oh, all of a sudden we're fucking with black people. We wouldn't mind doing a movie or TV show with the show with you. Like it happened with during Spike and Singleton's era, you know, it, 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 it it's happened a couple of times before. And what can happen is if you don't create stars and big vehicles that prove that we are as popular as anyone else internationally, it's easy for them to turn on the spigot on the niche thing. So we focus on bigger projects that are diverse. Um, I would say the best way to describe us is sort of like black folk, if we, if black people had created Imagine Entertainment. And you know, we got, uh, we're producing uh, Bel Air along with Westbrook. Um, we have uh, 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 about eight shows in development around town, um, working with, you know, with just amazing, uh, uh, amazing people. I don't know, I mean, you know, I don't, it shit doesn't sound that interesting to me, but, you know, we're well, very, very proud and wouldn't have thought we'd be here in a million years. That's a great, congratulations to that. Um, Charles, let's talk about the deal. Redbox, you and your company, uh, you created something. Um, Tell the world. Yeah, it's uh, me and my partner, Mark Danen. Um, Mark uh, used to work at ac in acquisitions at Lionsgate. Um, actually, um, uh, Dana Reed introduced us. You know, Dana Reed, no, I know Dana, yes. yes. Yeah, he, he called me when I was finishing Things Never Said and said, hey, I think a friend of mine might be interested in looking at the movie. And Dana um, and uh, Mark acquired it for Lionsgate. We developed a friendship. 
And when he left Lionsgate, he's continuously worked in acquisitions and he ended up over at uh, uh, Redbox. And, um, and then Lionsgate wanted to uh, finance the film that I just got through directing. And they uh, came to us and said, would you, you know, would you be interested in making more films? And it was, it's, I, he calls it the black, his company, the Black Imagine, I call ours Black Blumhouse because it's like for movies that are under five mil. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about it, the movies that Jason, like the first Purge, he said cost 2.8 and, and Sinister was 2.5 and Insidious was one. There's a, there's a lot of room there to actually truly be independent. And, and since I was a kid, I've always just wanted to be independent. Are you, you know? looking, are you looking for, we're, you're talking to a bunch of genre writers here. You're looking for various genres or what type of genre? Are you looking um, for? Right, right now, because of the, the, what works for them in terms of uh, what they distribute slash put out in their kiosks, we are focusing on action, thriller, uh, and suspense. And so, uh, and you know, some, again, something that could be made low to the ground and, and not cost a lot. You know, I'm, I, I get a script that by page 10, I'm saying, you know, this is gonna cost like $40 million. And then, and then they go, <laughs> yeah, but if you, you know, and it's like, no, not if you, it has to be written with that in mind. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you, what they, I believe what they tuned into was what Mark brings to the table and what I bring to the table. So, you know, kind of like what, what Malcolm was saying from stem to stern, pre-production, production post, I got us handled once it's time to turn the movie into something on the other side, Mark has that handled. So they saw us as a good combo. And, and, and talk, they, great. Talk to me about your new film, the film you just finished directing. Um, uh, it's called The Devil You Know. Um, it's, it stars uh, Omar Epps, Mike Ely, uh, Glenn Turman, Vanessa Bell Calloway, Will Catlett, uh, Theo Rossi, uh, BJ Brett. Um, and it's, it's kind of in the vein of, you know, for the old heads out there in cold blood or at close range, mm. you know, where a guy, um, gets caught up in a situation, um, uh, that affects his family, you know, but it's from the perspective of, um, what if the black sheep wasn't the worst person in his family? Yep, got it, got it. You proud of the film? You pr proud of your work on this film? Uh, I, you know what? I, 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 I got this whole. It's not Buddhist, but I'm, I'm. You know, it's the thing that everybody understands. I, I've it's blue collar is what it is. I bring my father's work ethic to how I work. I don't go high, I don't go low because the work still needs to be done. Got it. And so when I get started on something, when I'm in the middle of something or when I finish something, it's like the work is going to take on a life of its own that has nothing to do with me and nothing to do with how I feel or how, you know, it's like I have to be engaged to do the work and once the work is done, I have to move on to new work. I, it's, it's an assassin's mentality, I believe. Stop it, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Malcolm and uh, uh, Charles, we're going to take some questions now from people who are listening to this. Um, they have many questions. And uh, start with Kim Turner. Kim Turner, Malcolm, did the Falcon Writers Room build to Sam's line? I'm a black man carrying the stripes, stars and stripes. What don't I understand? Was that an aha moment you all had? The weight of that felt like a lightning strike. 
it it was that line existed in my head probably before we even wrote fade in on the first episode you know what i'm saying um um because i had already known that you know i wanted isaiah in there and i wanted him to embody sam's doubts about taking on that shield and we wanted the whole room all agreed including marvel we wanted isaiah to be right in like everything he presents sam with about why he should not you know take on that mantle he's right and so if sam does take on the mantle it's got to be in the face of that so we knew you know what i'm saying um that it was building towards that moment the entire i mean damn near from when I pitched it and definitely from when we started breaking the uh, season. Great. Okay, next question. Some people say that the current opening of doors is just like black exploitation in which white people will find a way to make all the money and the doors will close just as quickly as they did black exploitation. Do you believe this is true? And if so, how can we prevent it? Um, ownership. I mean, as long as you're spending what someone else, you know, the, when, when we first got into the business, we used to, as a group, you know, not to make us a monolith, but we used to say, we're spending all of our money, you should give us projects. And, and but then when you would look at the, at certain pockets, you'd see people raising their own funds. You'd see people using the platform of the first film or project that they made to have their own money and start pipelining their works through those funds. You win, you lose, right? You, 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 in, you invest, you take risks, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But this business is the only business that's not that the creative, as far as my studies have shown, this is the only business where until Tyler Perry, we did not have true ownership. Not like we didn't have a Barry Gordy. We don't have a Barry Gordy. We don't have someone who is in the center that, that teaches all of the people who come after him the, the cash money millionaires, the masterpiece, all of those cats come to fruition, come into existence because of the legacy of Barry Gordon and the Clarence Avons and the Dick Griffiths. And we don't have that in a way in this business where our mindset switches to just owning our own shit. When the, the two things about the two movies that I made independently, when I did my distribution deals, the first one comes back to me in probably the next six years. The second one comes back to me in eight. The first one, I'm going to uh, uh, switch ownership to my oldest. The second one, I'm going to switch ownership to my, my uh, youngest daughter. That's a good idea. They will, they will own them. They will own the, they will own the actual copyright and the underlying materials. And so- online. You know, like the same way they talk about 360 deals in music and how a lot of people who know the insides of the music business tell you to stay away from them and to own your publishing. And to, you think about it. Music has always talked about owning. And every time we've seen a Cadillac Records or some shit like that, by the end of the movie, the broke cat, who is usually a black man, black woman or otherwise, is sitting there going, you own my music. What is it, what is that telling you? <laughs> exploitation. That's and that's that's the true exploitation. You know, and I know a lot of people will sit around and say, "Yeah, but I can't make Avengers." Uh, you know, I don't have the money to make Avengers. Yeah, but make what you can. I have a question for you, Charles. Yeah, you know, this is to you. You wrote, uh, you're writing Sammy Davis. Yep. Um, and you wrote Oscar Micheaux. 
which is a yep. man who who uh, who was, as you just talked about, a man who owned his own material until his own everything until he didn't until things he got pushed out. He got overtaken by and was not celebrated until the late seventies. Exactly. So they killed that narrative completely. So tell in encapsulated form a little bit about Oscar Michaud and why that turned you on as a project, as a biopic you wanted to tell, wanted to do. Uh, well, I mean, to be, to always wanted to, to always have wanted to be an independent filmmaker, to be so inspired by Spike Lee putting together $175,000 to make She's Gotta Have It, to know that there was someone in, in 1919 with the same perspective, the same vision. Same hustle. I, yeah, same hustle. I was like, wait, and I get to tell that story? I get to actually like dig into this man's life in a way that will actually tell me in certain ways how to navigate my story? Mm -hmm. I had to. And so, um, uh, you're talking about a guy who, when he saw that he wasn't allowed to write novels because black folks don't do that, he wrote a novel. When he saw that the, uh, that the, you know, and he wasn't alone. See, that's the thing about this though. He wasn't alone in that vision of trying to create cinema for blacks from black. But he was the one that kept going and didn't stop when other people told him to stop. You know, which eventually became Spencer Williams, which eventually, you know, you go through history, you talk about like I, one of the most mortifying things to me, and I love the color purple, was, was when I saw a picture of Gordon Parks on set taking stills when he should have been the person directing. That was actually very uh, disheartening to know that one of the most incredible visualists who ever was in America, you know. Right, and most people don't know about the learning tree. No, most people learn about the learning tree or or he directed Shaft. You, you, know? Know? you know, so <laughs> if you bring it all back, we, you, what, you know, what do they say representation matters? To know that there was a six foot, six foot seven black man who was making melodramas that people were saying, nobody wants to see this. And he would sell out wherever he would take his films. They would have to buy out, uh, not theaters, but auditoriums because black folks just wanted to see themselves on screen. That uh, again, 102 years ago. Yes, yes, yes. He was dealing with the same thing that we're dealing with now. So when you talk about, you know, when you talk about stakes and when you talk about drama, the reason that we, I believe, were agnostic is because when we're sitting at home watching uh, uh, the, the Dick Van Dyke show, or Thunderball, <laughs> or, or those daring young men in their flying machines. We wanted to be all of that. Right, right. You know, and so as writers, it was like, well, you can, if, they, if they're not gonna let you make it, you can write it. And so that's kind of how we ended up being agnostic. And I think that all of that kind of comes from Oscar Michaud for me. Oh, good. Malcolm, I have a question for you. This is uh, from Matt Henry, Harry. Malcolm, I'd love to hear more about some of the intricacies of working with Marvel. The intricacies of working with Marvel. It's, it's a tough question because I'm not, I'm definitely going to, uh, first of all, it requires me, it would take too long to sort of describe because you have to, every single dimension of it has to be compared to other shit you've done so that you can get how different it is. Let me try and give you something though that uh, is at least kind of a, a snapshot. Like, 
I'd say, I'd say one of the things that's like there's a perception of Marvel that they they bring you in there and they tell you what to write and they control and they don't do that at all. Now they're going to be there and having opinions on every fucking word you write and they're going to pitch shit to you, but you, you are a writer at Marvel just like anywhere else and they need to see your ideas so that they can riff off of them. So I think that's one of the things that has been greatly exaggerated about the place. Like they don't fuck around for sure. They're gonna be in your mix. You know what I'm saying? There is things they're gonna do their way, but they're not holding the cameras for the directors and they're not typing on the keyboard for the writers at all. Um, um, one thing that was interesting about being at Marvel is because everyone there is trying to be there and ain't going nowhere and they don't have a high turnover rate so there's a comfort the culture like when i got into hot water not hot water like fucking up but like deadline and us pivoting and going in another direction with the series when that happens at normal studios it, it is they either become terrified of the writer everything the writer does and grind him or her in the dirt or they just bail on the writer depending on what it is you know what i'm saying and just say let's bring in someone new when we pivoted on falcon winter soldier they were like we want to go in a whole different direction and we want you to lead us there and this decision ain't got nothing to do with the creative it's da -da -da. this is just you know there's a bunch of other shit going on and my point being at every moment, on every draft I've turned in, even when the whole project briefly blew up, I always felt supported by them. Oh, they throw their arm around, they like, hey man, we with you. I, and I've actually, even in studios where I've had a good run working, I've never felt as supported as I did at Marvel, even when I was failing. So your voice comes through. They want your voice. They're not trying to homogenize your voice to, I mean, obviously there's a story they want to tell and they've hired you for a story they want to tell, but there's an idea that they want the Malcolm Spellman voice. They want Charles Murray's voice. They, that's what they're after. Yep. And okay. you could like, I mean, I, I, I think anyone who's, if anyone's seen, well, if you know me and know my work, you you can you can see what's going on with Falcon Winter Soldier. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Another question comes from Jonathan Giles. Would love to hear both of your opinions about the superhero space. Obviously, the big two will continue to come create, but what thoughts do you have about the opportunities for new hero stories? Um, they've been making movies from smaller comic book companies for a while. Mm -hmm. It's just that they don't look like comic, like Men in Black is a comic book. Um, R.I.P.D. is a comic book. Um, you know, um, Walking Dead is a comic book. So I think that they keep, they keep their eyes open on indie books and mm -hmm. that pick up steam, you know. So the space is open. Yeah. Look, just good stories. As television has evolved over the last few years with uh, newer and different voices, which shows that are on now or in productions have you two excited? I want to see the Soprano spinoff real bad. Um, um, you mean the movie? The movie coming up or is it a spinoff? There's one, whichever is coming up. The movie's coming up, yeah. Um, and, and the spinoff. Um, I, I need some great crime, and I'm a my my little dirty. What do you call it? Not dirty. Uh, my, <laughs> my my guilty my guilty pleasure. Uh, my dirty little sexy guilty pleasure <laughs> um, is uh, Longmire. Not Longmire. Fuck. I've been watching. I'm fucked up right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, gummies, gummies, gummies. Uh, Yellowstone. 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 Really? It's just so fucking soapy. It's, you know, like, 
I'm in season two. It's so soapy. I'm loving it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a blast. So um, I can go on and on. We I try to consume a lot of TV and movies. Um, it just keeps you uh, relevant and fresh and motivated. Um, um, I enjoyed Hacks. I watched Dave. Uh, I'm about to list all this shit. Y'all know what it is. I'm about to turn on the lights. <laughs> uh, Charles, tell us what gets you excited right now on TV right now. What movies get you excited right now? Um, I try to stay away from it because I feel like I feel like at a certain point you do too much of it, you start regurgitating. Mm, interesting, interesting. Um, I, you know, I I find myself watching a lot of old stuff mm -hmm. um basically to see how it came in and took shape um but PCM? PCM? Yeah. yeah the criterion channel yep yeah uh i watch a lot of foreign stuff i just i just feel like if 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 i get off of my computer and then walk into my my tv room and turn on any of the channels that are going right now and then watch it until I go to bed and then get up and start writing and then, you know, wash, rinse and repeat that I'm wash, rinsing and repeating. So, you are know. You, are you a fan of the French New Wave? You're a fan of the old German films? You're a fan of the- I'm a fan uh, of all of it. I, but, you know, but like the other, like a couple of weeks, a couple of days ago, actually, um, uh, there's a movie by Fritz Lang called The Testament of Dr. Mabusa. Yes. That was made in 1933. And when he made it, um, he, uh, he, in, he invested uh, Nazi doctrine into it. It's, it's lit it, but if you watch it right now, you would literally think that it was uh, uh, inspired by like Charlottesville and, 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 and the riot and the protests and shit like that. But he put Nazi doctrine into it. And then he, he, he uh, got a call from Joseph Goebbels and Goebbels uh, uh, ostensibly said, hey, we hear your movie's great. And I wanna talk to you about becoming the minister of film. And, and Fritz Lang said, he got off the phone and he went to the nearest train station and went to Paris <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and did not come back for 40 years. You know, so right, like, right. I like, I like, you know, digging stuff like that up because, at, you know, story, storytelling depends on two things. People eventually, the storytellers eventually opening themselves up to worlds that they don't understand and people dying. <laughs> 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 because that's why, you know, uh, you know, I'm gonna be 80 years old and some 25 year old is gonna watch some movie and gonna go, that's fucking fantastic. And then my 80 year old ass is gonna go, that scenes from this movie and that scenes from this. So I need to die for these people to, you know, appreciate what's coming up. You know, right, right. it was part of my problem with, with Tarantino. I had seen everything that he had seen. That's true. We've, I've seen, exactly. I've seen everything he's seen and he has the, the megaphone right now. He can regurgitate yeah. it up and, you know, he, great for him. But, but he, but he, even though we're like, in the same age group, he caught a generation that hadn't seen that stuff like we had. Right, exactly. You know, so I, 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 uh, I just, let me watch something old that's got nothing, nothing to do with my, my job, so to speak. I have a, one question for both of you guys. Um, uh, all things can't be perfect, but does great writing trump everything or does politics play into things moving forward? Um, great, great writing is politics. Ah. And I don't know. I mean, you, if he, my politics, social acumen fucking matters. It, it is that you're dealing with in this industry, you know, forget 
what your opinion is of the out of the product that these people put out or that we put out. Um, but you're dealing with a super high elite level of access, reach, resources, money, power, all that. Hollywood is high level. You know, there was a time not that long ago where there were more professional football players and there were working screenwriters. That's changed as TV exploded, but that's the norm for the level that's here. Being, being a great writer should be the goal of everyone, but being a physical specimen ain't gonna get you all the way through the NFL. You know what I'm saying? You, there is, polit when you talk about politics, if you talk about social acumen, that's gonna affect your career and your ability or it slash willingness to deal with it, you know, is is determined by your ambitions. And man, it all just feels like one long sentence. Charles? Well, I, I'll say this. When we talk about police, most police, when they were kids, they were uh, Tom Cruise's character in Born on the Fourth of July. They That's watched right. Westerns. They That's watched right. Westerns, and the Westerns made them want to be cowboys. And when you watch Westerns and people talk about how great Westerns are, the, the victor gets to tell the narrative. There's, there's never been, and I could, and if I'm wrong about this, it's because it was the deepest dive of deep dives. There's never been a Western directed by a Native American. That's a really interesting point. Someone will research that, but I bet you're absolutely right. Especially right. One over four million or more of a real budgeted Western. Uh, yes, ex exactly. So <laughs> now let's just take Westerns and look at, let's look at, let's go back to Tarantino. In Inglorious Bastards, the Nazi had a movie made about him. He was a hero because he held the fort against Americans. When we see that in Tarantino's films, because it is something that we are against Nazism, we go, we understand the politics of it. But we don't stop to think about the politics of Westerns. That's right, yeah. But it is still politic because those Westerns were taming the savages. The cops who watched them when they were kids grew up to be cops who tame the savages. If that ain't politics, I don't know what is. That's true. I, now, I, Malcolm was talking about something completely different. Malcolm, I think he was talking about the politics of navigating this business. That's to me a whole different thing. But when we, when, when we are able to look at marketing, when we're able to look at the business of creation, and that television was created mostly to keep advertisement alive, just like radio. Again, that's politics. That's, that's actually well put and uh, nicely said, Charles. Um, I think we have uh, a down to our last couple of minutes. Anything you two want to talk about together collectively or when I ask anybody in or about anything, please uh, throw it out there. I'd like to uh, hear your opinions. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to come back to uh, what I, I hope people understand. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking up. We spend a lot of time going, man, if I could only meet, if I could only meet Francis Coppola, or if I could only meet J.J. Abrams, or if I could only meet, and I tell people all the time, don't look up, look out. Because Malcolm, Shell, and I, we used to have to split money to buy pizzas. And, and when I, me and uh, my wife had our first kid and I was temping and I needed two weeks to just sit my ass down and write. I went to Malcolm and I told him my situation and I asked Ma Malcolm if I could borrow uh, a grand and he gave it to me. And my career 
rests on that kind of friendship. This is a hard business to, na to navigate, sure. All businesses are hard, but this business is more transient than most businesses. And if you can find people who can become a part of a collective, who can become true friends, like I feel this man is, I feel this is one of my dearest friends, not in the business, friend. And he and his wife have been there for me for years. And the people that have been there for me and the people that I've been there for, that's how we navigate this goddamn thing. That's real walkie talkie. <laughs> well, well said. And that's, uh, that's a wonderful way to go out. It, um, you know, friendship uh, really to me elevates this business. People hire each other because they're friends. People call each other back because they're friends. And that's why, Right now, a lot of black writers, a lot of women are working, a lot of people who have great things to say are finally being uh, being hired and putting things th things together themselves. So all that saying, we thank you so much, Malcolm Spellman. We thank you, Charles Murray, for being here today to uh, really uh, tell us from your heart exactly how things came, came together. And uh, we'll do it again anytime soon. Thank you for having us.